Hi, thanks for watching. I'm John Kreschke, and I'd like to tell you some Bayesian approaches to replication, analysis, and planning. In idealized scientific method, a posited theoretical mechanism generates a predicted influence, which is measured by some procedure involving independent and dependent variables, followed by data analysis and publication. In reality, every one of those steps involves many options and many choices. It's a garden of forking paths among researcher degrees of freedom. At each fork in the path, the researcher selects one, perhaps after the fact. These various types of selection have been given a variety of names, such as harking, that is, hypothesizing after the results are known, questionable research practices, p-hacking, and the file drawer problem. The problem with this selectivity is that it selects spurious, accidental findings that may not be reliable. The key solution to the problem is pre-registered replications. We select a path in advance and report the results regardless of the outcome. The Open Science Framework now has a thoughtful procedure for conducting pre-registered research, including thorough review of the proposed methods before data are collected. But what sort of replication should be conducted? One option is a conceptual replication that tries to test the underlying theoretical mechanism for some other path through the choices. It asks, will the prediction be confirmed? A problem with this approach is that whether it's confirmed or not, we don't know if the original finding is reliable. So instead, for the remainder of the presentation, I assume we are pursuing exact replication which asks, for the same path, will the finding be replicated? A recipe for exact replication was provided by Brandt et al., who specified these five ingredients. Three of the five do not involve statistical methods. But two of the five ingredients have statistical methods at their core. Ingredient three says the replication should have high statistical power, and ingredient five involves evaluating the results. Let's consider the last of these, how to evaluate results. Anderson and Maxwell provided a list of six goals for evaluating replication results. Three of the goals focus on the replication results only and assess the null hypothesis or estimate the effect. Two of the goals focus on assessing the consistency of the replication results with the original results. And one of the goals assumes that the results from both studies are representative of a common source and combines the results. Here I have rewritten the goals with these three main distinctions emphasized. The first row shows the emphasis on the replication results. The second row shows the emphasis on comparing the replication to the original. And the third row shows the emphasis on combining the replications with the original. I will now provide a cursory overview of merely a few of the various Bayesian methods that address these goals. I will start with the goal of achieving a precise estimate because estimation has been emphasized as an essential element of reporting results. In particular, in its instructions for a registered replication report, the Association for Psychological Science states that, quote, the final publication will include the following, a figure showing the effect sizes measured by each replication team along with a meta-analytic estimate of the effect size. The emphasis on estimating effect sizes rather than on the dichotomous characterization of a replication attempt as a success or failure based on statistical significance could lead to greater awareness of the shortcomings of traditional null hypothesis significance testing. Bayesian methods are especially good at providing parameter estimates with explicit degrees of uncertainty. Bayesian parameter estimation is simply reallocating credibility across parameter values. We begin with a prior distribution, such as the diffuse distribution shown on the left, which says that a wide range of values for parameter delta are weakly credible. Then we take into account some data and reallocate the distribution toward parameter values that are consistent with the data, as shown by the narrower posterior distribution on the right. Probability distributions can be summarized by the 95% highest density interval. Any value inside the interval has higher probability density than any value outside the interval, and the total mass of the interval is 95%. 
Notice that the 95% HDI is narrower in the posterior than in the prior, indicating that the estimate of the parameter has become more precise after the inclusion of more data. The point is that Bayesian estimation provides an explicit probability distribution on the parameter space, yielding rich information for the essential goal of achieving a precise estimate. If the goal is to assess a null value in the replication, the usual Bayesian formalization is hypothesis testing as model comparison. In Bayesian hypothesis testing, there is still reallocation of credibility across parameter values, but the key parameter of interest is a model index. The left box shows a model of the null hypothesis for which the prior distribution on the parameter is a spike at the null value which disallows any non-null values. The right box shows a model of the alternative hypothesis for which the prior distribution allows a range of non-null values. The top of the diagram shows the probability distribution on the two model indices, in this case, 50-50. With new data taken into account, credibility is reallocated across all the parameters simultaneously. In Bayesian hypothesis testing, the emphasis is on the model index. The Bayes factor is the shift in model index probabilities from the prior to the posterior. In this case, the model index probabilities have shifted to favor the alternative hypothesis instead of the null hypothesis. One important quality of this Bayesian approach is that it can favor the null hypothesis instead of the alternative, if the data are consistent with the null hypothesis. Another important quality of this Bayesian approach is that it makes an explicit alternative hypothesis as a distribution over parameter values, which constitutes a theoretical competitor to the null hypothesis. The ability to express theories as distributions over parameters leads to a formulation for comparing replication results with original results. Verhagen and Wagenmakers proposed a method for Bayesian replication testing. As highlighted here, the alternative hypothesis is the posterior distribution from the original experiment. The model comparison framework asks, which model can better account for the replication data, the model informed by the original results or the model that assumes a null effect? With the replication data, credibility is reallocated across the parameter values. The posterior distribution is shown on the right. At the model index level, highlighted here, the replication data in this case have produced a shift toward the alternative hypothesis, that is, toward the original study. If the replication data were more consistent with the null hypothesis, then the posterior distribution would have shown higher probability on the null hypothesis model index. Although not emphasized by Verhagen and Wagenmakers, this approach can simultaneously produce an estimate of the parameter from the combined data, that is, it produces a distribution over the parameters that exactly takes into account both the original and the replication data. Which nicely segues to the next goal for replication analysis, combining their results. When there are several replication studies, Bayesian software is especially nice for random effects meta-analysis because hierarchical models are very flexibly analyzed. In random effects meta-analysis, we start with the data from many specific studies or trials. The data are denoted by m sub 1 through m sub t. The data randomly come from trial-specific distributions centered on parameters denoted by mu with subscripts. The trial-specific parameters are randomly drawn from an overall distribution with central tendency denoted mu. It may seem that the best choice of parameter values is as shown here, with trial-specific parameters that exactly match the data, and a top-level distribution that spreads out to accommodate the dispersed trial-specific parameters. But a better choice of trial-specific parameters shrinks the trial estimates. Shrinkage of trial-specific parameters increases the overall likelihood of the data. Shrinkage is caused by hierarchical structure. Bayesian estimation provides a complete posterior distribution over all the parameters. There are no auxiliary assumptions or approximations to create p-values and confidence intervals. As an example, consider the effect of beta blockers on the frequency of death after heart attack. 
In 22 trials, heart attack patients were randomly assigned to beta blocker or control groups, and the number of deaths within a period of time was tallied. The relative death rate in the treatment group is denoted by mu and is the main parameter estimated for each trial and overall across trials. This forest plot shows the posterior distribution for the 22 trial-specific mu values and the overall value at top. Vertical lines mark the modes and the horizontal lines mark the 95% highest density intervals. Zooming in on a few trials reveals shrinkage. For example, at the bottom we see the posterior estimate for trial 14, in which the data denoted by the triangle actually showed more deaths in the treatment group than in the control group, but the posterior distribution has a mode near the overall mode, but with a tail strongly skewed toward the trial data. Bayesian analysis is also amenable to sequential updating across trials. This example comes from Kay, Nelson, and Heckler. They presented this forest plot of a non-sequential frequentist meta-analysis with each of four experiments individually analyzed and then a meta-analysis of them all. But with Bayesian methods, they did sequential meta-analysis, showing how the posterior distributions successively incorporate the information from the previous trials. An additional benefit is that the informed prior for the final experiment helped constrain the estimates of other conditions because of shared structure in the model. Another form of sequential meta-analysis was illustrated by Scheibehenna, Jamil, and Wagenmachers, who focused on Bayesian hypothesis testing instead of estimation. They used a fixed effects model instead of a random effects model, but the point here is that the Bayes factor can be updated as each successive trial is completed. This graph simply shows the value of the Bayes factor as data accumulate across studies. So far, I've talked about the fifth ingredient in the exact replication recipe, that is, evaluating replication results. Now, let's move to the third ingredient, having high statistical power. Traditional power analysis involves a point hypothesis and a single goal, rejecting the null. At the left of this diagram, the spike distribution illustrates a specific hypothetical value for effect size. The flow chart shows repeated random samples of data of a particular sample size. For each set of data, null hypothesis significance testing checks whether p is less than 0.05. The long-run probability of achieving this goal is called the power. In real research, however, we do not know a specific value for the hypothetical effect size. We are uncertain about it. And power varies dramatically with the hypothesized value. Bayesian generalized power analysis involves a distributional hypothesis and various goals. From the distribution of uncertain effect sizes at the left, we randomly choose one, then simulate random data, then apply Bayesian inference, then check the posterior distribution for whether each of the goals is achieved, and repeat until sufficient stability of the power estimate is achieved. We can check a variety of goals such as, is the Bayes factor large? Is the highest density interval precise? Does the HDI exclude a region around the null value? Where does the hypothetical distribution come from? Typically, it's the posterior distribution from previous data. The full process is displayed here. The top left shows using actual or idealized data to create a distribution of parameters, and the lower right shows the process of simulating data to compute the probability of achieving various goals. Complete details and software are provided in the book, Doing Bayesian Data Analysis. Another complete example, specifically for comparing two groups, is provided in an article in JEP General. In this example, idealized data are generated for the expected effect. Idealized data are far easier to elicit and intuit than distributions over complex parameter spaces. Then, a posterior distribution over a five-dimensional parameter space is computed. This captures uncertainty in the parameter values that describe the idealized data. Then, the perspective probabilities of achieving various goals are computed. If power is not sufficiently high, the perspective simulations are repeated with a higher sample size. So far, I've talked about using the posterior distribution from the original experiment for various analyses. But what if the original study was not pre-registered and we suspect that it may suffer from publication bias? There are principled ways to address this issue in a Bayesian framework. 
The key is to specify models of the biases and then estimate the degree of bias. Guan and van de Kerkhove proposed four possible censoring models of publication bias shown as the four rows of this diagram. For example, in the third row, the censoring model assumes that any test with p less than 0.05 is published, but tests with p greater than 0.05 have only a small probability of being published. This censoring implies that the probability distribution of effect sizes shown at the right artificially enhances the probability of large effect sizes in the literature. Suppose we have an effect size in observed data as marked by the red line. The usual uncensored sampling distribution of effect sizes says that this hypothetical small value of the effect size delta is virtually impossible because the observed value is so far out in its tail. But the censored data distribution says that this hypothetical small delta is quite probable. That is, it allows us to say that smaller hypothetical effect sizes are consistent with the large observed effect size. Bayesian inference provides an entire posterior distribution of delta and over the censoring models. This approach is intriguing but nascent. Ultimately, however, we can never be sure that modeling of bias correctly undoes bias, and instead we must do pre-registered replications. In summary, I've surveyed examples of Bayesian methods applied to replication. A replication test to see if the replication data were closer to the null hypothesis or to the posterior from the original. Meta-analysis using hierarchical models with Bayesian estimation generalized power analysis, in which we use the posterior from the original, inferring parameter values under publication bias. In conclusion, the Bayesian framework is very useful for formalizing the statistical questions in the pursuit of replication. You can see this talk again on YouTube, and I thank you for your attention.